pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We want to give you thanks for this day. Father, fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Touch each heart today. Guide us and fill us with your presence, Father. And just, Father, anybody that's facing anything, I just want to ask a prayer for them as well and uh, to um, help them whatever they're facing, Lord. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Y'all may be seated. Amen. How many of y'all were excited to uh, praise God and lift our voices before before Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father? Amen. You know, uh, there's different ways of praising God. I don't know if y'all knew that. There's different ways of praising God. It's not just uh, lifting our voices and singing to God. It's not just doing those things. But it's um, also in the way we live. Also in the way we live every day. The way we live our lives. Amen? And that's also how we praise God. You know, a lot of, a lot of us don't stop and think about that. We think, well, it's just singing to God, and that's, that's good enough. But the way we praise God is by the way we live. By our example, how we are a light to, to other people around us. Amen? Amen. And that light is the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. All right. Um, we normally do a children's story right now. I don't know if he, if, he, um, if he wants to come up here to the front. We usually have a lot more children. It's okay if you don't want to. All right. You want to bring him up here real quick? You have Daddy sit up here with him. <laughs> All right. Well, we're gonna tell you, we're gonna tell a children's story. Do you know the story of Moses? Yeah. All right. <laughs> what do you know about the story? About Jesus. Cool. Um, do you know that Moses helped his people come and cross the Red Sea? Yeah. What else did Moses do? Not uh, sure. <laughs> All right. Well, let me tell you a little bit of the story of Moses, okay? Moses helped his people. God told Moses to go get his people and um, free them and, and release them, right? So Moses went up to Egypt and he was telling Pharaoh and said, Let my people go. But Pharaoh, do you think Pharaoh just let them go? No. No. Moses kept asking Pharaoh, let my people go. You know, God is commanding that you let my people go. But the, uh, Pharaoh was stubborn. Yeah. You, know, you know what stubborn is, right? <laughs> A lot of times we can be stubborn, right? So uh, Pharaoh wouldn't do it. So uh, God allowed Moses to do uh, bring uh, plagues and different things. Because Pharaoh was being stubborn. So finally, Pharaoh let his people go. And Moses took his people and they came to the edge of the sea, the edge of the ocean. But uh, Pharaoh changed his mind and brought his soldiers. And they came to attack Moses and his people. And then they're at the edge of the sea, at the edge of the ocean. What do you think would happen next? They had nowhere to go. They couldn't cross the Red Sea. They couldn't cross the ocean, right? So what happened is God made another miracle. God made another miracle where he allowed Moses to touch the Red Sea with his staff, and the Red Sea split. Can you imagine that? The ocean splitting in half? Or the Red Sea split in half and they were able to cross the cross. And when they got to the other side, God closed the Red Sea. And the, the Pharaoh and his army and the Egyptians weren't able to get to them. So that's the story of Moses. Did you like the story? Yeah. Do you want to tell everybody what your name is? Creed. 
All right, how old are you? Five. Five years old. All right, well, let us pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we want to pray uh, for Creed here. and We just want to ask that you bless him. And we want to thank you um, because you tell us that uh, we are to be as children. So we just ask a special blessing um, on, on Creed here today and may you be with him. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. All right, thank you. You may see that. We got a little shy. <laughs> All right. Last Sabbath, we had a special uh, music by Vanessa. We have Vanessa every other Saturday or every other weekend. So, um, if you ever feel inspired to want to do special music, let us know. Or even if you want to read poetry, you know, there's poetry. Or if you want to play an instrument, you know, let us know and we will uh, work that in. Because um, it's, uh, it's awesome. You know, God has given us talents. God has given us gifts. And we don't want to take those for granted because did you know God can remove those talents and gifts from you? The Bible says that God can remove those talents from you if we don't um, use them. Because the reason God gave you those talents is to bless other people. Amen? The reason God gave us those talents is so that we can bring people closer to Christ. So... If you have the talent of singing, if you have the talent of reading poetry, if you have the talent of playing an instrument, whatever talent you may have, we must use them. A lot of times when these talents are given to us, we allow these talents to go to our head, amen? And we don't want to do that. And that's what's happening with a lot of the movie stars, a lot of the, the music stars. They, uh, we think about famous people, right? We think about all the famous people and we think, wow, they can sing or they can act in a movie or they can do a lot of things, right? We think about all those things and we're like, but did you know God gave them that talent? Did you know God blessed them with that talent? But they're using it for the wrong reason, amen? A lot of the people that are famous that are singing started out in the church. A lot of them were Christians. A lot of them started out in the church and they realized how good they could sing or how good they could act or whatever talent or gift they had, right? But God gave them that talent so they can bless other people, so they can bring them closer to Christ. So if you have a talent, and we all have a talent, we all have a gift, all you have to do is ask God what it is. If you have that, use it. What's that old saying? If you don't use it, you lose it. Because God will remove that talent from you if you don't use it. He has given it to you for a reason. So if you, if you feel inspired to want to do special music one of these days, let me know ahead of time. If you want to play an instrument, you want to read poetry, even if you want to do an acting. I know a lot of the younger people are into acting now. If y'all want to do a skit or an acting skit up here, let us know. Let us pray as we go into the message. Heavenly Father, we come before you. Father, I ask that you speak through me, that you give me the words to speak, and that I may be guided by your Holy Spirit, Father. We cannot do anything without your Holy Spirit. Therefore, we ask for your Holy Spirit. And also to touch each person's ears and hearts, that we may be listening to your word, Father. We just ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath. The message of this sermon is titled, True Blue. True blue. You might, you might be thinking, what is he going to talk about? 
Well, I'm going to be talking about the color blue. You may be wondering, well, this, that's why my Bible is blue. That's my favorite color. Is blue. And um, it used to be, my favorite color used to be um, black. My favorite color used to be black. But when I heard this message, when I heard this sermon many years ago, about 10 years ago probably, I was like, you know what? I got to make my favorite color blue after listening to this message. The color blue is very significant to God. The color blue is very powerful. Have y'all ever heard about this? No? Okay. So this might be new to a lot of you guys. But this message has been preached by many Jewish people for a long time. How long have Jewish people been around? A long time, all the way back into the Bible. You know, the Jewish people are mentioned in the Bible, right? Yeah. So this message has been preached for thousands of years, for hundreds of years. So we're going to dive into the Bible and we're going to discover what, how important this color is. What do you think when you hear the color blue? Some of us might think, I've got the blues, right? Some of us might think, I'm sad because the color blue makes me sad. But isn't it, isn't it crazy, the things of God, how the enemy can turn them around and have it mean the opposite? The color blue really represents happiness, but it represents a lot more. The color blue, we think of the, of the blue sky, we think of the, the ocean looking blue, right? What's also, another, uh, what's also another thing that signifies blue? You said the sky, yes. There's a stone, there's a precious stone called sapphire, blue sapphire. And we're going to be talking about that, and you're, you're going to be surprised. The Jews have known this for many years. Revelation, it is revelation to us. We continue to learn the beautiful things that the Bible has for us. I will present this today, that God's throne is made of sapphire blue. And that the Ten Commandments are also made of blue sapphire stone. This might be neat to you guys. You know, we'd stop and think. We think, well, when God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, he must have carved the stones out of the mountains. But did you know that wasn't so? The stones that the Ten Commandments were written on the stones came from the throne of God. Because when God was in the presence, or when Moses was in the presence of God, it says God was standing on a throne. It says God was standing on a blue sapphire stone. So therefore God carved the stones out and wrote the Ten Commandments on them. So if the Ten Commandments were written on the stone that came from the throne of God, and the Bible tells us that the throne is made out of sapphire, what color are the Ten Commandments? Blue. Blue sapphire. Uh, there was a study made, and I didn't write it down, but there's a study made that blue sapphire stone is worth a lot more than a diamond. And uh, if y'all don't believe me, I can look it up. But why is it so valuable? Why is it so expensive? You know, God says that, uh, God tells us that when Lucifer was walking on the, on the stones and he was covered with all these precious stones, it tells us that all these diamonds and stones and beautiful stones we're given to Lucifer. We're given to God's people. But of course, we know what happened with Lucifer, right? We know that Lucifer fell. 
We know that Lucifer uh, rebelled. So there's nothing wrong with having stones and jewelry. The Bible does tell us not to overdo it. The Bible does tell us not to over-exaggerate. We don't want to be doing the bling-bling thing, right? <laughs> We don't want to be, we want to be humble, right? God gives us precious stones. But this precious stone of sapphire means a lot. Moses went up to Mount Sinai in the presence of God, and the blue sapphire stones would be cut out of the throne of God and given to Moses. Well, you may say, I don't know. I don't know if I can believe that. But let's go to the Bible. The Bible has all the answers for us, right? I could be telling you this story and you might be thinking, well, he's crazy. I've never heard this before. But the Bible will give us all the answers and the Bible will speak to us. If you don't have a Bible with you, you want to write down the Bible verses and look them up at home. That's fine as well. But let's go to the book of Exodus chapter 24, verse 1 and 2. Exodus, it would be Genesis, and then, and then Exodus. Exodus 24, 1 and 2. Now he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihab, and the seventy of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. And Moses alone shall come near the Lord, but they shall not come near, short, nor shall the people go up with him. Amen. So here we have Moses and the elders are called up to the mountain. And then later Moses to go up alone. So all the elders and the 70 people go up to this mountain because God calls them up there. Says, y'all come up here. God is saying, come up here. But then when they get to the certain part of the mountain... He says, okay, I just want you, Moses, to come up here by yourself. All right? Why is that? Because Moses was chosen as the leader of the Israelites, right? Of course, we know what happened there. God would give Moses the two stones, and the Ten Commandments would be written with the finger of God. Just picture it all the Ten Commandments being written supernaturally. You have these stones that God gives Moses, but God is writing on the stones with His finger. He's just writing all the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Don't bow down to any graven images. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. Honor your father and mother. Do not kill. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not covet. Do not commit adultery. All the Ten Commandments, right? Do not covet. God writes all the Ten Commandments with His finger and then gives Moses the stones, the tablets, right? And then He takes them down to His people. But something very special and beautiful Moses saw that will blow your mind. It would be a sapphire pavement under the feet of God. Let's read about it. Right here in 24, verse 9 and 10. Then Moses went up, and also Aaron, and Ahad, and Abihab, and the seventy of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet as if it were paved, paved work of what? Sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens as its clarity. So it's saying that when God saw, or when Moses saw God standing on his throne, it was a what? A pavement of sapphire. Clearer just as clear as the sky. What does the sky look like? Blue. So this is a blue sapphire. The throne of God is made of blue sapphire. 
It's awesome, right? Who else would see the throne of God made of sapphire blue? It wasn't just Moses. It wasn't just Moses that saw God standing on a blue sapphire uh, throne or, or pavement. The other person would be Ezekiel. Let's go to the book. Let's go to the book of Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 1, 20 and verse 22. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 1, verse 22. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 1. All right. Ezekiel, chapter 1, and verse 22 says, and likewise of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures was like the color of an awesome crystal stretched out over their heads. Now let's go to verse 25 and 26. A voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads. Whenever they stood, they let down their wings. And above the firmament over their heads was like was the likeness of a throne in appearance like a sapphire stone. And the likeness of the throne was the likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Here we see the sapphire stone again. Here Ezekiel is going into a vision. He's seeing the angels. God is showing Ezekiel the angels that are ministering before everyone, right? Right? But at the same time, when Ezekiel is looking at God and the angels, he sees God standing on a sapphire stone. This sapphire stone is where God would cut out a piece of the tablets and write the Ten Commandments and give them to Moses. Blue is powerful. Amen? How amazing here we see that the chair of angels at the throne of God and the sapphire is once mentioned again. Let's go to 24. Let's go to Exodus 24 verse 12. Second book of the Bible. Exodus 24 verse 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me unto the mount and be there, and I will give you the tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written, that you may teach them. Amen? So here God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. Two tablets, right? On one tablet, you have the first four commandments. On the second commandment, on the second tablet, you have the other six commandments. You may ask, well, I thought it was always five and five. No, it's actually four and six. Because the first four is our relationship with God. The other six is our relationship with our neighbor. Amen? That's why God made it that way. The color blue signifies the Ten Commandments laws. Today we use the color blue to represent what? Law. You know that a lot of the things that we do, we get it from God. Don't we use animals to signify different states or even the United States? What's a symbol for the United States? An eagle, right? What's a symbol for uh, maybe a college uh, game? They, they use different mascots, right? We get those ideas from God. Because God talks about beasts and symbols. We take those ideas from God. So it's no wonder that 
we have taken the color blue to represent what? Law. Law enforcement, right? <laughs> I'm not saying that they're always just, but God is just, right? God is fair. God is always fair. He's not always going to, he's not, God is never going to make a mistake. God is going to be honest with us. God is going to take care of us. Sometimes God wants to, uh, he wants to uh, give us a, spirit, a spiritual spanking, right? Sometimes God will allow us to go through certain things for us to open our eyes and for us to come back to God. But it's, God never makes a mistake. God is just. God is fair. So blue represents law. The color blue represents law, but it represents God's law, God's Ten Commandments. Isn't it sad how today most Christian churches want nothing to do with the law? They don't want nothing to do with God's Ten Commandments. If it was, if the Ten Commandments were written by God Himself, don't y'all think it means a lot? Did you know, out of everything in this world, the only thing God wrote on His own was the Ten Commandments? Because even the Bible was written by man. Even the Bible, God instructed men to write the Bible. Even the ceremonial laws and the feast laws, God instructed men to write. Everything God inspired men to write. The only thing that God said, I'm writing myself. <laughs> the only thing God said, I'm going to take care of myself. I'm going to write it with my own hand, with my own finger, was the Ten Commandments. That's how much God's law means to him. The, the Ten Commandments is the character of who? Of God. Of Jesus Christ. So any time we attack God's law and we say, we don't need to keep the Sabbath anymore. That was for the Old Testament. We're attacking God. Because did you know that the Sabbath was mentioned at creation? Did you know that's the only commandment that was mentioned at creation? That is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. It says that after the six days God rested, after creating this whole planet in six days, He rested and He sanctified and blessed the seventh day. Yeah. He was so specific in telling us it's the what? The seventh day. We can't say, well, I'll choose what day I want to make it holy. As long as we choose one day. But God says no, the seventh day. Amen. That's why we have a seventh day calendar. It hasn't changed. The names have changed. But we still have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. The seventh day is holy. The seventh, the number seven is also very significant. God has very special numbers and very special colors. Here in a minute, I'm going to talk about a few other colors. The number seven means what? Completion. Complete. When he had the uh, when he had the people march around the the walls, Jericho, right? Yeah. How many times did God command them to march around? Seven. Seven times. When he told that man. To, he, that, he, that man wanted to be cured of leprosy. How many times did God tell him to dip himself in that river? Seven, Seven times. Right? In the book of Revelation, it talks about the seven spirits. The number seven is very important to God. It's very significant. There's another number, the number 12. The number 12 is also very significant to God. The 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 disciples, the 12 apostles, the 12 gates in the New Jerusalem. So there's, and then also the number three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
um, there's a lot of things that God mentions in the Bible three times. You might think, man, you might think, well, God thinks I'm, I'm deaf, I can't hear. Because you, you might read something and then it repeats it again and then it repeats it again. The same thing. When God repeats something three times, it's very important for us to listen. Amen? It's kind of like when we get on to our kids, right? <laughs> How many times have I told you to do this? I know y'all are good kids, right? <laughs> Your mom's shaking her head in the back. <laughs> y'all are good kids. But God is awesome. But also God has colors that signify things. That's what we're reading right here, the color blue. Let's read uh, Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18. The book of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Jesus, anytime you read, anytime you read in the Bible and it's written in red, this is Jesus' actual words, all right? So this is Jesus speaking to us right here. Book of Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 and 18. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is, what? Fulfilled. Jesus telling us, I didn't come to get rid of the law. What's wrong with you guys? The problem that the Jewish people had at this time is that they only focused on the law. They didn't focus on having a relationship with Christ. If you don't have a relationship with Christ and you're trying to keep the Ten Commandments, you're doing it in vain. You're being like the Jewish people that were during that time. Well, if I keep the Sabbath holy, um, I gotta make sure I don't work from this time to this time. I gotta make sure I don't go to the store from this time to this time. Uh, I gotta make sure I don't, I'm not cursing. I gotta make sure I'm not stealing. But you're doing it out of your own strength. Is that gonna save you? No. The only way we're able to keep God's law is if you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why the first four commandments is a relationship with Jesus Christ. What's the first commandment? Don't have any other gods before me. That's us having a relationship with God. Right? Second commandment. Don't bow down to even graven images. Even if they're crosses. Don't bow down to a cross. Don't bow down to an angel. Don't bow down to a picture of Jesus. Don't bow down to a picture of Mary. Right? Those are images. God says, I'm up here. Those are just images. Those are just pictures. If you have a picture of somebody that has passed away, is that picture really that person? No. That's just an image. So don't talk to that picture, right? <laughs> we don't want to talk to the picture. But that's us having a relationship with God because God says, I'm a jealous God. I want you to worship me, only me. I don't want you to worship these pictures of me. I don't want you to worship these other gods, these false gods. And there's a lot of false gods, right? And the first one was, don't have any other gods before me. What is that? Sometimes we can make sports our God. Sometimes we can make movies our God. Sometimes we can make entertainment our God. Sometimes we can even make our spouses our God, or even our children. You know, uh, a lot of times, I know back in my day, back in my day, my mom, if I was to talk back to her, she would slap me in front of everybody. I'm not saying do that. I'm not saying do that. <laughs> <laughs> but my mom would not put up with anything if I misbehave, right? Um, you know, even... And today, I see that the children are the bosses, right? And 
the children are not the boss. The parents are the boss. That's the way God has set it up, right? So we can sometimes spoil our kids and give them everything. When we spoil our kids and give them everything they ask for, what are we doing right there? We're making them our God. Amen. We lose our souls. And so we can make sports our God. We can make our cars. If you have a fancy car, we can make that our God. Or a fancy truck. Uh, we can make whatever it takes more of your time. And you don't make time for God. That you're making that your God. Right? Amen. Amen. And then, of course, the third one, don't take the Lord's name in vain. We take the Lord's name in vain by the way we talk. How, how is our speech? How, how do we talk around people? Is it filthy talking? Or is it positive talking? It don't always have to be about God. It don't always have to be about, uh, you know, when you're with your family, it don't always have to be trying to get them to, to get saved. It can be positive things too. You know what? You know, I'm happy that you're here. Or... Is there anything I can do for you? You know, uh, a lot of times we want to we want to get people to be saved, and we force the gospel on people. And we force it on them, and we force it on them. But we don't stop and think about their need first, right? Do they need help financially? Do they need a ride to go get a job interview? Do they need encouragement? Hey, uh, I know. I know you're discouraged. I'm here to encourage you, right? Do they need food? Do they need food? Is somebody locked up in jail and we don't visit them, right? Is somebody sick at the hospital and we don't go pray with them? So we need to stop and think about people's needs. You know, Jesus says, uh, Jesus says in the Gospels, that I was sick and you didn't visit me. I was hungry and you didn't feed me, right? I was in prison and you didn't come visit me. I was thirsty and you didn't, you know, I was cold and you didn't give me something to warm up with. I was all these things. And he tells the disciples all these things and the disciples are like, when did we see you hungry, Jesus? When did we see you in prison? And Jesus was referring to the people. Jesus was telling them, when you don't take care of all these needs, then you're not really following me. Amen? So we need to stop and think about people's needs. And then the fourth commandment, keep the Sabbath day holy. It's not just about not working. God is saying, I'm giving you a day off to just relax. You know, uh, I know sometimes they, you know, our parents might get on to you and say, hey, go wash the dishes or go throw the trash away or help me around the house. You know what? You have permission on the Sabbath to say, you know what? I'm not going to do that today. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if it's, if it's one bag of trash, it's cool. If it's a few dishes, it's cool. But you know what? Relax on the Sabbath day. Enjoy the Sabbath day. For us to come closer to God, amen? amen? God wants you to take it easy on the Sabbath. I like your smile, Creed. <laughs> God wants us to enjoy the Sabbath, but most importantly, He wants us to not be distracted with all these things and come closer to Him. Have a special date with Jesus. For us to have a special date with Jesus on the Sabbath. Do y'all see how these first four commandments is having a relationship with God? The other six is having a relationship with your neighbors. Amen? So the problem that the Jewish people had is they didn't have a relationship with God. Most of them didn't. Therefore, they were trying to keep God's law out of routine, out of ritual. You have to keep the Sabbath holy. You have to do these things. You have to do these things. Don't do these things. They made strict laws and 
They were always watching you, looking around the corner. <laughs> I've known of pastors that do that. I've known of pastors that do that in certain churches. That's not right. They're not God, right? Us as men, we're not God. There's only one God, right? Yes, we are to encourage each other to stop doing certain things that are sinful. We are to encourage each other in love. Just like Jesus went to Mary Magdalene that was caught in prostitution, right? He told her in love, I don't condemn you. I'm not putting you down because you just slept with somebody. But you know what? Go and sin no more. Jesus told her, go and sin no more. Stop doing those things. That's what Jesus told her. And I love you. I love you, right? If we follow God's example in encouraging people to stop sinning, if we do it in love, we we'll probably get way more better results, right? It doesn't mean that we shouldn't tell them, yeah, that's okay. I, I still love you. No. I love you enough to tell you that sinful lifestyle is going to lead you to be lost. Amen? But I love you regardless. Amen? So that's the best example is to follow Jesus' example. The Jewish people were always watching everybody. You took too many steps on the Sabbath. Did you know they did that? Did you know they would count your steps? How many steps you took on the Sabbath? And if you took, I can't remember the number it was, but if you took a certain amount of steps, you broke the Sabbath, according to the Jewish people. Is that what God said? No. That's what man did to God's law. They made up, they made up things for God's law. And sometimes we do the same. We're so strict on our brothers and sisters and pastors and watching you. Oh, and don't, I've known of pastors to drive by your house and to see where you're at. I've known of churches where they want to see your check stuff where to see if you're returning your tithe and offerings. That's between you and God, right? If you return your tithe and offering. That's between you and God. Should we return our tithes and offerings? Yes. And should we preach about saying, yes, uh, you know, now is the time to return your tithes and offerings. But if you do, great. If you don't, I'm not in charge of making sure you do or don't. That's between you and God. Amen? So we want to follow God. We want to follow God. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians. It's after Acts. Is it after Romans? First Corinthians ten, one through four. Moreover, my brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that our fathers were under the cloud and passed through the sea and were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock and that followed them and that rock was who? Christ. Here it tells us that Jesus Christ represents that rock. What do you think that rock represents? You, you remember that we, we just read right here that everybody passed through the cloud. Everybody passed through the sea. Didn't we just read that um, in Exodus, that in Ezekiel, I'm sorry, that uh, the sapphire represented like the blue in the sky? And in the sea? 
And then we just read that that sapphire stone was cut out from the throne of God and given to Moses. And the Ten Commandments were written out there. This rock is really a blue rock. This blue rock represents who? Jesus Christ. It says that this rock followed them. Do you think there was a, a rock that was actually following them? A, 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 a literal rock? No, it was spiritual. By the way, that's where we get the, word, the term rock and roll. If y'all didn't know that. That's where we get the term rock and roll. But like we see, the real rock and roll was Jesus. But the world, the enemy, has given these terms a negative and bad wording, right? Jesus is that rock that we stand on, right? Jesus is this rock, solid foundation. As long as we follow Jesus Christ, as long as we stand on the rock Jesus, we're going to be all right. There's a parable that says that uh, two men build a... Two men build a house. One man built his house on the sand. The other man built his house on the rock, on the solid foundation, right? And they were both had beautiful houses. They both had the same exact house. It's just one of them was built on the sand. The other one was built on the, on the rock. But then the, a storm came and the sea the waves got bigger and bigger and it hit both houses. One of those houses was knocked down to the ground. Why was it knocked down to the ground? It wasn't on a solid foundation. It wasn't built on that rock. The house that was built on the sand fell down. That's us, brothers and sisters. That's us. A lot of times we come into the church and we get very emotional. We praise God and we lift our hands up and we cry, which there's nothing wrong with that. But that's all we do. We don't go to the Bible. We don't go home and read our Bible. We don't follow the doctrines that God has for us. For those of you who might not know what the word doctrine means, it means God's laws for us, God's truths for us. I'm not talking about the doctrine of the church. I'm talking about the doctrines in the Bible. There's, there's certain things in the Bible that God has for us to do. Amen? Those doctrines is the rock, is the foundation. Because if, if I'm not obedient to God's Ten Commandments, if I don't understand what the Ten Commandments are for me in my life, and I'm just building my, my relationship with Jesus in an emotional state, and that's it. When storms come in your life, when you get fired from your job, or your husband leaves you, or your wife cheats on you, or somebody gets sick, or somebody passes away, or something very drastic happens in your life, when that wave comes, and that storm comes, and you're not standing on the solid foundation, guess what's going to happen? God, what happened? I thought you were going to be there for me. Why did I lose my job? Why did you allow me to lose my job? No. The storms are going to come regardless whether you're serving God or not. The storms will come. But is your, is your relationship based on the rock, Jesus? Is your relationship on obedience to what God has called us to know? Amen? It's not just saying, Lord, Lord, I love you. It's not just saying that. It's being obedient to God. Obedient to what he has for us. That is building a foundation for your house. If, you, if you're just building on emotions, then you're building your house on the sand. Amen? Let's go to the book of Numbers, the Old Testament, chapter 15. The 
book of Numbers 15, 37 through 40. Thirty-seven through forty it says, "This is going to blow you off mind." Thirty-seven through forty. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, "Speak to the children of Israel. Tell them to make tassels. What are tassels? You know, like when you go to homecoming, you have that tassel, or even when you graduate and they have that tassel on your on your on your hat. That's what a tassel is." It says. Tell them to make tassels and on the corners of their garments throughout their generations to put a blue thread in the tassels of the corners. Amen. And you shall have the tassel and you shall make and you shall and you that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and to do them. Amen. And that you may not follow the heart tree which you own in your own heart and in your own eyes are inclined. That you may remember to do all my commandments and the holy and be holy for your God. Amen. Amen. So God told Moses, no Aaron. No, actually Moses, I'm sorry. God told Moses, talk to the children of Israel. I want them to make a tassel. I want them to put it on their garment, and on that tassel, I want you to put the color blue. And every time they look at that tassel, I want them to look at that tassel daily. It says throughout their generations, right? It says, look at that tassel and remember to keep my commandments. It's awesome, right? Why the color blue? We just read about it, right? Because the Ten Commandments were made sapphire blue. Sapphire blue stone. Of course, we can't all carry a, a miniature Ten Commandments with us everywhere we go. You know, uh, we would kind of look funny carrying around two tablets of stones everywhere we went, right? Like, check it out, I have the Ten Commandments right here. <laughs> No, that's why God told them, make this tassel and put the color blue to remind you of the Ten Commandments. So now every time you see the color blue, what it should remind us of? It's the Ten Commandments. The commandments of God. That is awesome. And um, I feel to mention the high priest would wear this this suit. Not suit, but it was like a like a robe. And they had all these colors. All these stones, all these colors. But in all those stones, the color blue was there as well. But after Jesus died on the cross, who became our high priest? Jesus. So Jesus wears all these colors. Jesus up in heaven is wearing all these colors, including the color blue. Because the, the the high priest of the Old Testament wore those wore those colors. Here's a story of a woman that was bleeding year after year after year. She was tired and desperate. I don't know if y'all know the story. It's found in the Book of Luke. She had a um, she heard of a wonderful man named Jesus. That Jesus was walking in this, in this, uh, in this on the streets there, and that he was healing people, he was helping people. This woman had spent all her money on doctors and cures. I mean, uh, not to sound crazy, but this woman was on a continual period. She just bled every day, every day, and she was tired, and she was, she was tired of being sick. She heard of Jesus, that he was healing people, and he said, I need to go to him. I need to go to him. I know he will heal me. I know Jesus Christ will heal me, and that's exactly what she did. 
But remember, Jesus was what? Jewish. If Jesus is Jewish, and back in the Old Testament, every Jewish person, every Jewish man was commanded to wear that blue, with that tassel with the blue thread on it. That means Jesus was also wearing this tassel, right? Let's go to Luke chapter 8, 43 and 44. The book of Luke. The book of Luke, chapter 8, 43 and 44. And it says, Now a woman having a flow of blood for twelve years, who has spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind and touched the border. Here in the, in the Greek, is re, the border is referring to that tassel. Came behind and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. This lady touched the tassel of Jesus Christ and immediately she was healed. You know, uh, Jesus stops and says, who touched me? And the disciples tell her, well, everybody's touching you because there was a great crowd. This woman had to make her way through the crowd to touch Jesus. But she finally did touch his tassel. And immediately she was healed. Amen? The color blue is very important. God's law is very important. There's only certain things that the Bible calls holy. He calls marriage holy. He calls the, the word of God holy, the scriptures. He calls God holy, Jesus Christ holy. Right? He calls the Sabbath holy. There's only very few things he calls holy. He calls his law, his Ten Commandments, holy. Amen? So if he can call all these other things holy, why would he call his Ten Commandment law holy? It's very important to him. The Ten Commandments leads us to Jesus Christ. The Ten Commandments don't save us. The Ten Commandments leads us to the one that does save us. Amen? That's why he wants us to keep his Ten Commandments. Not just the Sabbath, but all Ten Commandments. I've, I don't know, uh, I've come to find out that a lot, of, a lot of Christians are sometimes the biggest liars sometimes. A lot of Christians are sometimes the biggest liars. And it's sad, because that's one of the commandments. If we think that we're helping everybody out and we're coming to church every weekend, but we're lying all the time, do you think you're going to get into heaven? Who are you fooling? If you have a problem with lying, simply confess it before God and say, God, help me. I don't want to lie no more. I don't want to be a person that lies all the time. Right? That's one of the commandments. Thou shalt not lie. <laughs> so all ten commandments are important to God. They all mean everything to God. Amen? So, um, and it's only through Jesus Christ that we're able to keep his law. The colors of the high priest are, I'm going to tell you what the colors of the high priest are now. The colors of the high priest are blue, red, purple, and gold. All these colors are royal colors. Amen? So the high priest would put on this it's kind of like a vest over their robe. And it would have all these colors right there on the front of their garment. Including the blue, uh, the tassel with the blue thread on there. But it would have blue, red, purple, and gold. Those four colors. Amen. 
So all those colors are important to God, but most importantly, blue. So if you like red, you're okay. <laughs> if you like gold, you're still okay. If you like purple, I like purple. I really do like, my first vehicle was purple. And that's because I was into prints back in the day. <laughs> I was into Prince, so when, when Prince passed away, I was kind of, it did, it did uh, kind of, I got a little emotional. <laughs> but um, yes, I, I love purple. I like the color purple. Blue, red, purple, and gold, those are the colors of the high priest. We know blue represents God's Ten Commandments, God's law. But let's read something real quick. But Satan also has a false movement, right? Satan, the devil, has a false movement and is pushing the churches to say, you don't need my law anymore. As long as you got, love God with all your heart and with all your soul, and as long as you love your neighbor as yourself, those are the only two commandments you need to worry about. You don't need God's law no more. That was for the Old Testament. You don't need God's law anymore. We're under grace. We're not under the law. How many of y'all have heard that before? We're not, we're not under the law. We're under grace. What does that mean? For the video right here. The only time we're under the law is when we break the law. If you break the law out here in the streets, you're under the law. That's what it means. But when you ask God for forgiveness, He gives you grace. So if, you're, if you have grace now, then you're not under the law. That's all it simply means. It's not telling us not to keep the law. That's not what, it's, what that verse is telling us. What it's simply telling us is that if you have Jesus Christ, if you have asked God for forgiveness, then you're not under the law anymore. That's not telling us not to keep His law anymore. It's just saying you're not under the punishment of what that law is going to do to you. Right? Yes, we are under grace. If you have chosen to give your life to Jesus Christ, we're under grace. And we don't deserve it. God gives us that grace. But in these last days, the devil is doing a great job of telling the churches, telling the preachers, you don't need God's law. That was for the Old Testament. That was for the Jewish people. That was for the Israelites. No. The only laws that came to an end were the feast laws. Because when Jesus died on the cross, it says the veil of the temple was torn supernaturally, exposing the most holy place. Amen. Those were feast laws. Those feast laws ended at the cross. Why? Because they pointed to Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, we needed a priest. In the Old Testament, you needed to sacrifice a lamb. In the Old Testament, we needed to present the first fruits. In the Old Testament, we, pay, we kept the Passover. In the Old Testament, we did all those things because they all pointed to who? Jesus Christ. Who is the, who is the lamb? Jesus Christ. Who is the high priest? Jesus Christ. Who is that blood that they put over the door uh, when uh, you know when uh, Moses told them the Israelites to put blood over the door, and the angel of death was going to pass and kill all the first fir the firstborns. It says the blood of a lamb, right? That's where we get the Passover from. <coughs> Who is that blood? The blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of the lamb. All those were feasts. All those ended at the cross. So when they tell you the laws of ordinances were nailed to the cross, which laws were nailed to the cross? Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross. All these feasts pointed to Jesus Christ. So you don't have to keep the Passover anymore. You don't have to... Um, Sacrifice a lamb anymore. Thank God for that, right? We don't have to uh, keep all those different feasts. 
because they all pointed to Jesus Christ. But the other laws, the Ten Commandment laws, continue. Because the Ten Commandments is throughout our lives. They continue. You can nail, what's easier to nail to, to a cross? Paper or stone? Paper, right? The feast and ceremonial laws were written in a book. The Ten Commandments were written on stone. So when it tells us, the Bible verse, it tells us that the law of ordinances were nailed to the cross, it was the book of ceremonial laws that were nailed to the cross because Jesus was nailed to the cross. They all represented him. Revelation chapter 17. Check this out. This is our last Bible verse. Revelation chapter 17. As I read this, I want you to pay close attention to what's missing. Revelation chapter 17, verse 3 through 6. This is when John went to a vision. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Scarlet means red. Which was full of names and blasphemy, having a having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, scarlet is red, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of, of the abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots and of the abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. Yeah. We know that woman represents a church, right? Yeah. God took John and gave him a vision and told him, Check out this church in the last days, having seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads, by the way, are the seven hills in Rome. The ten horns is the ten kingdoms of Europe divided. All right? It tells us the colors of this church. It says in the last days, this church, this false church, how do we know it's a false church? Because it calls her a harlot, a prostitute. Amen. So if this is a false church, it has all the colors of a high priest. Did y'all notice that? It has all the colors of the high priest. Which color is missing? The color blue. This church in the last days has all the colors of the high priest. Meaning... They still claim to be God's people. In the last days, this church, we're Christians. I'm here to preach to you what God is, means to you. I'm a pastor from this church, and I'm here to tell you what the Bible has for you. But I'm going to teach you everything that the Bible has for you except the color blue. Except God's law. So that's why it shouldn't surprise us that these churches in the last days are not teaching God's law anymore because they're missing the color blue. This mother, this is the mother church, it says she's the mother of harlots. That means she has daughters. So it's not just the church in Rome that's the mother, but it's the daughters. That means she has many churches. So if you're in a church and they're telling you, you don't need to keep the Ten Commandments anymore, that's for the Old Testament. That's one of her daughters. That's one of her daughters. We need God's law. We need God's Ten Commandments. Because that's obedience for us to follow God. Amen? We can see the beauty of the significance of the color blue. When you look to the sky or to the ocean, of course they're not literally blue, right? They look blue. 
So that's why God says, when you look to the sky, it's to remind you of God's law. When you look to the ocean, it's to remind you of God's law. When you look at a sapphire blue stone, it's to remind you of what? God's law. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually surprised with every, all those things that you see around you, and all these banners. What color are they in? They're in blue. The color blue rep reminds us of uh, God's law and what it means to Him. And I hope this has blessed you guys. I have more notes on this. I have more notes on this and I pray that um, it has blessed you and has opened your eyes on the significance of all these colors and all these numbers. But how important the color blue is to God. So... If somebody tells you, uh, you have the blues? Yeah, I got the blues. <laughs> you know, uh, we put negative things sometimes on the things of God. And the color blue is joy and happiness. Blessed is the man that uh, follows God, right? Amen. Blessed is the man that is in Jesus Christ. And with that said, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. Thank you for showing us the wonderful things that you have for us in your word and how important the color blue is to you and how a lot of people, a lot of churches are leaving the color blue out. But we want to hold on to that color blue. We want to say we have the blues. We want to say that we're happy to keep your law. All Ten Commandments, Lord. Not just the Sabbath, but all Ten Commandments. Help us to live by them. Help us to teach them to others. And to teach our children to follow them. And Father, just bless this church. Bless every person here today. Guide them as they go home. And that um, they're blessed with today's message. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I forgot to do something real quick. I forgot to collect tithes and offerings earlier. Uh, so at this time, uh, my wife's going to pass the tray up. And if you have something to return, that's great. If you don't, that's okay as well. And um, as soon as um, she collects that, we will pray for that. So what did y'all think about the color blue? Awesome, right? God is amazing. Those four colors. Amen. So all those colors are important to God, but most importantly, blue. So if you like red, you're okay. <laughs> if you like gold, you're still okay. If you like purple, I like purple. I really do like, my first vehicle was purple. And that's because I was into prints back in the day. <laughs> I was into Prince, so when, when Prince passed away, I was kind of, it did, it did uh, kind of, I got a little emotional. <laughs> but um, yes, I, I love purple. I like the color purple. Blue, red, purple, and gold, those are the colors of the high priest. We know blue represents God's Ten Commandments, God's law. But let's read something real quick. But Satan also has a false movement, right? Satan, the devil, has a false movement and is pushing the churches to say, you don't need my law anymore. As long as you got, love God with all your heart and with all your soul, and as long as you love your neighbor as yourself, those are the only two commandments you need to worry about. You don't need God's law no more. That was for the Old Testament. You don't need God's law anymore. We're under grace. We're not under the law. How many of y'all have heard that before? We're not, a, we're not under the law. We're under grace. What does that mean? For the video right here. The only time we're under the law is when we break the law. If you break the law out here in the streets, you're under the law. That's what it means. But when you ask God for forgiveness, He gives you grace. So if you're 
if you have grace now, then you're not under the law. That's all it simply means. It's not telling us not to keep the law. That's not what, it's, what that verse is telling us. What it's simply telling us is that if you have Jesus Christ, if you have asked God for forgiveness, then you're not under the law anymore. And it's not telling us not to keep his law anymore. It's just saying you're not under the punishment of what that law is going to do to you. Right? Yes, we are under grace. If you have chosen to give your life to Jesus Christ, we're under grace. And we don't deserve it. God gives us that grace. But in these last days, the devil is doing a great job of telling the churches, telling the preachers, you don't need God's law. That was for the Old Testament. That was for the Jewish people. That was for the Israelites. No. The only laws that came to an end were the feast laws. Because when Jesus died on the cross, it says the veil of the temple was torn supernaturally, exposing the most holy place. Amen. Those were feast laws. Those feast laws ended at the cross. Why? Because they pointed to Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, we needed a priest. In the Old Testament, you needed to sacrifice a lamb. In the Old Testament, we needed to present the first fruits. In the Old Testament, we kept the Passover. In the Old Testament, we did all those things because they all pointed to who? Jesus Christ. Who is the, who is the lamb? Jesus Christ. Who is the high priest? Jesus Christ. Who is that blood that they put over the door uh, when, uh, you know, when uh, Moses told them, the Israelites, to put blood over the door and the angel of death was going to pass? And kill all the first, first the firstborns. It says the blood of a lamb, right? That's where we get the Passover from. <coughs> Who is that blood? The blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb. All those were feasts. All those ended at the cross. So when they tell you the laws of ordinances were nailed to the cross. Which laws were nailed to the cross? Jesus Christ was nailed to the cross. All these feasts pointed to Jesus Christ. So you don't have to keep the Passover anymore. You don't have to um, sacrifice a lamb anymore. Thank God for that, right? We don't have to uh, keep all those different feasts. Because they all pointed to Jesus Christ. But the other laws, the Ten Commandment laws, continue. Because the Ten Commandments is throughout our lives. They continue. You can nail, what's easier to nail to, to a cross? Paper or stone? Paper, right? The feast and ceremonial laws were written in a book. The Ten Commandments were written on stone. So when it tells us, the Bible verse that tells us that the law of ordinances were nailed to the cross, it was the book of ceremonial laws that were nailed to the cross because Jesus was nailed to the cross. They all represented him. Revelation chapter 17. Check this out. This is our last Bible verse. Revelation chapter 17. As I read this, I want you to pay close attention to what's missing. Revelation chapter 17, verse 3 through 6. This is when John went to a vision. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. Scarlet means red. Which was full of names and blasphemy, having a having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, scarlet is red, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, having in her hand a golden cup full of the, of the abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead 
a name was written, Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots and of the abomination of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. We know that woman represents a church, right? Mm -hmm. God took John and gave him a vision and told him, check out this church in the last days, having seven heads and ten horns. The seven heads, by the way, are the seven hills in Rome. Mm -hmm. The ten horns is the ten kingdoms of Europe divided. All right? It tells us the colors of this church. It says in the last days this church, this false church, how do we know it's a false church? Because it calls her a harlot, a prostitute. Amen. So if this is a false church, it has all the colors of a high priest. Did y'all notice that? It has all the colors of the high priest. Which color is missing? The color blue. This church in the last days has all the colors of the high priest, meaning they're still claimed to be God's people. In the last days, this church were Christians. I'm here to preach to you what God is, means to you. I'm a pastor from this church, and I'm here to tell you what the Bible has for you. But I'm going to teach you everything that the Bible has for you except the color blue. Except God's law. So that's why it shouldn't surprise us that these churches in the last days are not teaching God's law anymore. Because they're missing the color blue. This mother, this is the mother church. It says she's the mother of harlots. That means she has daughters. So it's not just the church in Rome that's the mother but it's the daughters. That means she has many churches. So if you're in a church and they're telling you, you don't need to keep the Ten Commandments anymore, that's for the Old Testament. That's one of her daughters. That's one of her daughters. We need God's law. We need God's Ten Commandments. Because that's obedience for us to follow God. Amen? We can see the beauty of the significance of the color blue. When you look to the sky or to the ocean, of course they're not literally blue, right? They look blue. But that's why God says, when you look to the sky, it's to remind you of God's law. When you look to the ocean, it's to remind you of God's law. When you look at a sapphire blue stone, it's to remind you of what? God's law. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually surprised with every, all those things that you see around you and all these banners. What color are they in? They're in blue. The color blue rep reminds us of uh, God's law and what it means to Him. And I hope this has blessed you guys. I have more notes on this. I have more notes on this and I pray that um, it has blessed you has opened your eyes on the significance of all these colors and all these numbers, but how important the color blue is to God. So, if somebody tells you, uh, you have the blues? Yeah, I got the blues. <laughs> you know, uh, we put negative things sometimes on the things of God, and the color blue is joy and happiness. Blessed is the man that uh, follows God, right? Blessed is the man that is in Jesus Christ. And with that said, let us pray. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. Thank you for showing us the wonderful things that you have for us in your word. And how important the color blue is to you. And how a lot of people, a lot of churches are leaving the color blue out. But we want to hold on to that color blue. We want to say we have the blues. We want to say that we're happy to keep your law. 
all Ten Commandments, Lord, not just the Sabbath, but all Ten Commandments. Help us to live by them. Help us to teach them to others and to teach our children to follow them. And Father, just bless this church. Bless every person here today. Guide them as they go home and that um, they're blessed with today's message. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.